which is the way of ignorance. In order to possess what you do not possess, you must go by the way of dispossession. In order to arrive at what you are not, you must go through the way in which you are not. Acceptance of your ignorance is the only way you can begin to gain any kind of wisdom, in other words. And what you do not know is the only thing you know. This sounds very much like Socrates, doesn't it? Remember, he said this in Plato's Apology. The only thing I know, he says, and that's what makes me, he says, better than you, Miletus, is at least I know I don't know anything. The one thing I know is I don't know anything. As opposed to you, Miletus, who you think you know lots of stuff and you actually don't know much of anything. And what you own is what you do not own. You've got to give everything away. You're, we're reminded of what Christ says, Matthew 16, 25. He who saves his soul will lose it. He who loses his soul will save it. Luke 9, 24, the same idea. And what you own is what you do not own. And where you are is where you are not. We finish, then, part three, with all of these repetitions. And with, of course, the idea of the journey, the spiritual journey of both St. John of the Cross as well as Nakarjuna. And, of course, the power of the paradox, as we've seen it, right? Um, remember our paradoxes of the hollow man, right? Shape without form, shade without color, paralyzed force, gesture without motion. These notions, the, for T.S. Eliot, he saw modernity as a paradox, an oxymoron. Well, let's finish in 2A. Of course, this notion that darkness can be devastating, but it can be terrifying, but it can also be, it can also be useful, right? The theater, the train. And the ether are, are, are three similes in 2b that we, we, we can uh, think about. And 3a, and I like to throw, as, as you know, because when we learn, we're connecting new information to information. I like to throw, for example, a new title at you. Let's think about Thoreau's Walden. Do you remember what he said? I went to the woods. Remember those famous lines? I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately. He says, I wanted to front only the essential facts of life, which begs a question. How do you know what you really need? to exist. Let's go to a 3B question. How do you know what you really need? Well, one way to do it is to ask, could I live without it? Could I live without it? See, for example, that smartphone that's sitting there on the desk in front of you, could I live without it? Some of you will say, absolutely not. The rose says, are you sure? Because I think you can. I think you could. Well, I can't live without air. That is true. So you're saying that that smartphone and air are the same? Well, I guess they're not. Really? So what are the essentials? What are the things that you most need in your life? And of course, Thoreau went to Walden for those two years so that he could figure out what those were. Because sometimes, if we're distracted from distractions by distractions, sometimes we're not so clear about what we really need. Be still is the answer that's given here, part three. All right, let's turn now to part four. And part four, again, is the very brief, short, lyrical poem. When T.S. Eliot was asked about this in part four, he said in a letter to an Ann writer. He said, the heart of the matter is contained in part four of East Coker. Wow. So in other words, if you ask T.S. Eliot what's the most important part of all the four quartets, he said the heart of the matter was right here in part four of East Coker. Well, that makes us sit up right away and want to take, you know, immediately note. Again, just to remind, this is our little lyrical poem or prayer that sits right in the middle of the quartet, okay, to get us ready for the fifth Hard, all right? So let's go ahead and go to it now. We're going to listen again to the reading. It's not a very long reading. So let's see. Can you fully engage? Can you be mindful during your reading of these lines? Let's see how well you do. The wounded surgeon plies the steel that questions the distempered part. Beneath the bleeding hands we feel the sharp compassion of the healer's art, resolving the enigma of the fever chart. Our only health is the disease if we obey the dying nurse, whose constant care is not to please, but to remind of our and Adam's curse, and that to be restored our sickness must grow worse. The whole earth is our hospital, endowed by the ruined millionaire, wherein, if we do well, we shall die of the absolute paternal care that will not leave us, but prevents us everywhere. The chill ascends from feet to knees. The fever sings in mental wires. If to be warmed, then I must freeze and quake in frigid purgatorial fires of which the flame is roses and the smoke is briars. 
The dripping blood our only drink, the bloody flesh our only food, in spite of which we like to think that we are sound, substantial flesh and blood. Again, in spite of that, we call this Friday good. Okay, I've had some students that say, whoa, whoa, this is some very interesting vampire-like language going on here. Well, of course, we are into the Christian sacrament of the Eucharist. The idea that when one is drinking the, the wine in Eucharist and one is eating the bread, one is involved in remembering or participating in the death of Christ. Of course, Christ, right away, the wounded surgeon. Let's go to work here and notice as well all of the war references. It's compelling. This is a compelling little poem. By the way, notice that each is a five-line stanza with an end rhyme scheme. Do you see it? A, B, A, B, B. Do you see it? Steel, feel, and then part, art, chart. Do you see it? In other words, this is very intentional closed form poetry. We haven't had a lot of this throughout four quartets and yet here we have it. Let's go through it now for each of the five lines and see what it is that he's saying. The wounded surgeon plies the steel that questions the distempered part. Right away, note the paradox. Doctors have to do sometimes nasty things to our bodies to save our bodies. Isn't that weird, right? In other words, they inflict pain. Doctors can inflict pain on us so that we don't have pain down the line. This is a spiritual teaching of a kind. And it takes us back to Plato's cave allegory, doesn't it? The notion that we have to go through some versions of fear and pain to be able to come to the intellectual perspicacity or freedom that Plato says we all long for. Notice he, he says, beneath the bleeding hands, we feel the sharp compassions of the healer's art. Of course, blood here is going to be symbolic, right? Uh, many have called the wounded surgeon Christ. Some have considered the wounded surgeon uh, the church, the dying nurse of the, next, of the next one. The sharp compassion of the healer's art. Notice now it's compassion, it's not love resolving the enigma of the fever chart. Resolving, of course, leads us to want meaning, and later at line 158 it will be restoration to be restored. The enigma of the fever chart. In other words, life is an enigma. And we have these questions like, what's the point of all of it? Like, what, what, why am I here and what's all this about? Well, here again, we have answers. They're old answers, maybe. They are answers. The question, of course, is are we willing to abide the answer? Our only health is the disease. Again, note the bizarre paradox here. We, uh, we think about Yeats' sailing to Byzantium, right? Um, uh, an aged man is but a paltry thing, a tattered coat upon a stick. Unless soul clap its hands and louder sing for every tatter in its mortal dress. And then later, even in part three, O sage is standing in God's holy fire, as in a gold mosaic of all. Come from the holy fire, heard in a gyre, and be the singing masters of my soul. Consume my heart away, sick with desire and fastened to a dying animal. Well, T.S. Eliot is playing a very similar game here. Our only health is the disease. The very fact that we live is going to be significant for us because, again, we're reminded that you have a pulse, but not for long. If we obey the dying nurse, again, maybe, maybe the church, maybe the teachings of the church, whose constant care is not to please. The doctor isn't there to make you happy. The doctor is there to save your life, physically, right, to save your life. But the doctor, the church's job is to remind of our and Adam's curse, we're to Milton, of course, in Paradise Lost, and his attempts to try to explain the theodistic question about evil in the world. Go back to the Harvard Classics and watch our lectures there on Paradise Lost. We're playing the same game, right? And that to be restored, to be saved, to be resolved, the enigma of the fever chart, our sickness must grow worse. In the end, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better, if you will. This is, of course, the teaching of any contemplative tradition whether it be Christian or Hindu-Buddhist, it doesn't matter. You've got to go through a lot of work, and it's Plato as well, and it's pedagogy. You've got to go through a lot of work to be able to get out the other side. The whole earth is our hospital. Your experience of life is the way that you come to any kind of restoration. Endowed by the ruined millionaire, some see the ruined millionaire as God, some see the ruined millionaire as Adam. 
back to Paradise Lost again. Adam and Eve living as millionaires in Eden and then participate in the eating of the forbidden fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it ruins not just them, right? Remember the opening lines of Paradise Lost of man's first disobedience and the fruit of that forbidden tree which brought death into the world and all our woe, right? Until one greater, Christ came. Wherein, he says, if we do well, we shall die of the absolute paternal care that will not leave us. God's love forever takes care of us, but prevents us every way. In other words, God's love is forever there taking care of us or preventing us, if you will, right? And then at line 164, the chill. We think back to Burt Norton, lines 135, um, and, and, and again in part four, where the word chill is just there. The chill ascends from feet to knees. Here, you can't help but think about Socrates and in, in, in Plato's Phaedo getting up, drinking his hemlock, walking around, and they ask him if it's starting to move from your feet up into your knees. Or, for example, Falstaff as well when he dies, right? That notion that death is creeping, creeping, creeping. It's a, it's a powerful word picture. The chill ascends from feet to knees. The fever sings in mental wires. If to be warmed, then I must freeze and quake in frigid purgatorial fires. We're back, of course, to uh, Dante, right? And uh, as well, we're going to hear a, a little bit more about this in Little Getting, the fourth of the poems in passage four, redeemed from fire by fire, right? Of which the flame is roses. We're back to our symbolism of roses. And the smoke is briars. So a, 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 an, an image from nature to help us to be reminded here that what he's saying is that if you want to be saved, you have got to go through the process, right? And it is a painful process. And now to some of the most graphic visions, imagery of all the four quartets, the dripping blood, our only drink, of course now we're talking about the Eucharist, right? The Christian mass. The bloody flesh, our only food, in spite of which we like to think that we are sound, substantial, flesh and blood. Again, in spite of that, we call this Friday good. Again, this poem published on Good Friday of 1940, right? Notice that we end on Good Friday in this poem. Not Easter Sunday, the resurrection, but rather Good Friday, which is, of course, the death of Christ on Friday, right? Well, all kinds of powerful stuff going on here, right? The idea that the doctor has to hurt us to heal us, that is to say God. Of course, pay attention as well to this idea that mass or religion or ceremony um, saves us in the same way that the ceremonial dance of part one helps those people, right? As well, of course, the importance of sacraments is, are, are, are being um, pointed out here. And maybe what T.S. Eliot is pointing out as well is, again, back to Holloman, lips that would kiss form prayers to broken stone. That the, the idea is cathedrals are made out of stone, right? The stone is broken. In other words, there's something lost. Our modern culture, we cannot, we cannot um, uh, understand or appreciate or respect these kinds of ceremonies anymore. You'll remember Nietzsche's madman passage, God is dead and we've killed him and buried him in our churches, right? The Eucharist, of course, for T.S. Eliot, and I think this is why he said this is the heart of the matter. The Eucharist is the classic example of the attempt to try and join Plato's first box of the physical with the second box of the metaphysical. And, of course, this allows or somehow explains the way in which the Logos can be embodied, right? The wisdom that is being referenced in this poem. And it is a mystery. It's an enigma, right? It's a mystery. Well, at 2A of Christ's uh, humility, we might, uh, T.S. Eliot might say, Christ's humility must become the seeker's humility, right? A major, a major theme. Things got to go bad before, uh, before, worse before they get better. Think about Plato's cave allegory. That kid doesn't want to come out of that cave, does he? He doesn't want to be dragged out of that cave kicking and screaming. He doesn't want to experience the pain of fear uh, and, and pain. He doesn't want to have to go through that. And yet, once he gets outside, he has a different kind of knowledge. Not that opinion stuff of the cave. Now he knows those were just shadows on the wall, right? Of course, at level 2B, the symbols blood and fire come to mind. Of course, the Eucharist is the most important symbol of this one, right? 
at 3A, well, we think about Milton's theodicy, that question about how is an all-loving, all-powerful deity going to allow for pain in the world? And the answer that Milton will give and the answer that T.S. Eliot will give is, of course, the Christian sacrament of the Eucharist. Finally, at 3B, this question, do you believe that religious or even political ceremonies of any kind really matter? Do you think they're that important? And do you think they help us to remember things that are maybe more important or more sacred? Do you think that our culture has in fact lost the ability to respect the sacred? What are your thoughts about that? Well, we're studying a poem that will challenge us, obviously, so uh, maybe, maybe for us at least, this is a legitimate question to ask. All right, now here we go. We turn now to East Coker Part 5, Union and Communion. These will be lines 174 to 211, the end of the poem, of course, right? Here, we're going to see an attempted reconciliation, just like in Burt Norton. All four of these poems will do this in the fifth, in the fifth uh, part, the fifth movement, right? A reconciliation of the tensions between beginning and end, death and birth, darkness and light. That is to say the middle way. Now, we're going to go now here to back to our intro lecture when I said that one of the powerful ways, at least for me, to read four quartets are the lines that are about to happen when T.S. Eliot identifies that he has been for 20 years in between wars, struggles, like Scylla and Charybdis from the Odyssey. All right, I'm going to challenge you. This is some long, uh, a bit of long lines notice of reading. I'm going to challenge you. Conquer monkey man. Let's see how well Let's see how well you do, all right? Here we go. So here I am, in the middle way, having had 20 years, 20 years largely wasted, the years of L'Enfant de Guerre, trying to learn to use words, and every attempt is a wholly new start and a different kind of failure, because one has only learned to get the better of words for the thing one no longer has to say, or the way in which one is no longer disposed to say it. And so each venture is a new beginning, a raid on the inarticulate, with shabby equipment always deteriorating in the general mess of imprecision of feeling, undisciplined squads of emotion. And what there is to conquer by strength and submission has already been discovered once or twice or several times by men whom one cannot hope to emulate. But there is no competition. There is only the fight to recover what has been lost and found and lost again and again, and now under conditions that seem unpropitious. But perhaps neither gain nor loss. For us, there is only the trying. The rest is not our business. Home is where one starts from. As we grow older, the world becomes stranger, the pattern more complicated of dead than living. Not the intense moment isolated with no before and after, but a lifetime burning in every moment, and not the lifetime of one man only, but of old stones that cannot be deciphered. There is a time for the evening under starlight, a time for the evening under lamplight the evening with the photograph album. Love is most nearly itself when here and now cease to matter. Old men ought to be explorers. Here and there does not matter. We must be still and still moving into another intensity for a further union, a deeper communion through the dark cold and the empty desolation the wave cry, the wind cry, the vast waters of the petrol and the porpoise. In my end is my beginning. One or two of you have pointed out that it's, it's so beautiful that we have reading for us the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi because so many of you are Star Wars fans. Uh, and it seems like, especially part five of East Coker, I mean, it just deserves to be read by the voice of the person who is the Jedi master, right? The sage of the original Star Wars film. Um, with that in mind, though, let's go right to it. Again, we're back to the importance of positions. Now, again, 
So, he says, here I am. The ontological, the epistemological questions, ontology related to being, epistemology related to what we know. It's always, it seems to be about the important questions. What are those questions? Let's list them again. I mean, these, obviously, we know them well in 303 because we're always asking about them because we study literature and history, of course. But they're the questions, right? Who am I? Where am I? Notice here, here am I. Why am I? St. Augustine said there's one more question that's even more important than all of those. That's, of course, the Christian question in theology of whose am I? Here I am, in the middle way. We're back to that idea of Dante again, right? Having had 20 years, think of it, 1918, to 1938, 39, that's 20 years between World War I and World War II. 20 years largely wasted, not lost on us, that wasted makes us think of wasteland from 1922, right? The years of, and then he uses this French term, the Lothar de Guerre, which between the wars, we talked already about how, I think this is the way to read four quartets, the struggle, the tension, for T.S. Eliot, the, the, the explorer, old man ought to be explorers, the explorer, that tension between the political struggles, the literary struggles, I mean, we already, we already saw some of that, we're about to see it again right here, he's going to say, you know, those guys that came before, they basically crush any motivation that you have to ever really consider yourself great. Maybe that's the way we get to humility, is to expose ourselves to people who are going to remind us of how little we understand and how little we know, maybe. And then finally, of course, that spiritual struggle as well. We go back again to those lines of J. Alfred Prufrock. That's not what I meant at all. That's not it at all. It's impossible to say just what I mean. He says, 20 years largely wasted trying to use words. Hamlet's words, words, words comes to mind. And every attempt is a holy...